this is Dr. Paul Kurlansky from Columbia University. It is my privilege and pleasure on behalf of the Society of Thoracic Surgeons to welcome you to this webinar series on failure to rescue, a new STS quality metric for cardiac surgery. I have no disclosures. From the earliest planning stages of the STS database, the founders recognized not only the importance of risk adjustment, but the need to incorporate more than just mortality in the assessment of professional performance. The success of the STS database is legendary and the Quality Measurement Task Force has been more than proactive in developing a rich portfolio of composite me measures that fulfill this mandate. Failure to rescue can be defined as mortality following a complication. So the question might well be asked. The society has developed such well-established models for mortality and for complications, which have excellent discrimination, calibration, and reliability. With such well-developed models, why do we need another metric, one that addresses mortality and complications as a combined metric? Well, the answer goes back a few years to the parallel to the development of the risk-adjusted database in cardiac surgery. A researcher by the name of Silber and his colleagues used Medicare data to define a new metric which they called failure to rescue, the mortality of patients who had complications. Complications, they found, tended to track with patient characteristics, but failure to rescue appeared to be more closely linked to hospital characteristics than merely patient characteristics. Although adoption of the concept was initially slow, interest has emerged in virtually every area in surgery and in much of medicine, culminating in the Agency for Healthcare Quality and Research naming failure to rescue as a patient safety metric, the National Quality Forum giving their endorsement, and CMS identifying failure to rescue as a publicly reportable metric. So although formal evaluation in cardiac surgery was first undertaken by the Michigan group, we all owe a tremendous debt of gratitude to Dr. Fred Edwards for formally exploring failure to rescue amongst, cardiac, amongst uh, cabbage patients in the STS database. It should be noted that failure to rescue focuses primarily on the post-operative phase of care in patients who experience a complication, and it therefore reflects the ability of the team and their care pathways to salvage such patients. So the findings of this study were remarkable in two regards. First of all, mortality increased dramatically with the number of complications, as you can see in the graph on the left. And as many in the field have found in other scenarios, as the mortality increased, failure to rescue increased more dramatically than complications. As you can see in the graph on the right, complications when broken into tertiles, complications increased from 11.4 to 12.6 to 15.7 percent of patients, but failure to rescue nearly doubled across the same spectrum. So this set the stage for the development of failure to rescue as a quality metric in cardiac surgery. Based on this pioneering work, we examined the records of over a million patients from a three and a half year period. In accordance with the established STS risk models, we chose the 80% of patients with cabbage, aortic valve replacement, mitral valve, <coughs> excuse me, mitral valve repair or replacement, or cabbage associated with each of these valvular operations. Of these, 12% had suffered 
any of four complications for which the SDS has established risk models. We started with the five complications included in all of our composites and eliminated deep sternal wound infection after exploratory analysis due to its low prevalence. This left us with 127,318 patients who were divided into training and validation models. As you can see here, there was a wide distribution of patients and complications across both training and validation models for each operation, enabling us to integrate operation into the risk model. Definitions were the same as for pre all of the previous SDS risk models. However, variable selection was unique in that failure to rescue is essentially a metric of post-operative care. Therefore, this enabled us to incorporate not only preoperative, but select intraoperative variables as well. For computational efficiency, we used the STS predicted risk of mortality as a summary score rather than all the individual variables in our usual mortality risk models after we had demonstrated virtual equivalence of model discrimination with each approach. But to this was added all of the operations and all of the potential interactions between operation into a single model. And of note, were added intraoperative factors such as excessive or large amount of red blood cells, unplanned operation, need for circulatory support, prolonged cardiopulmonary bypass, and cross clamp times, as these were felt to be intraoperative factors indicative of serious risk for mortality following surgery. The final model followed the hierarchical approach of previous SDS models, accounting for specific, excuse me, specific hospital case mix, but notably not accounting for hospital-specific variables that are in the SDS database, such as volume, teaching institution, etc., because the purpose of this model was to distinguish performance across institutions. So what did we find? Well, not surprisingly, as complications per patient increased, the mortality went up quite dramatically. As you can see, those patients who had no complications had lower than a 1% mortality, but patients with one complication had 8% mortality, two complications, more than three times that, 31% mortality. Patients who had all four complications, more than greater than 50% mortality. Moreover, specific combinations of complications differed quite uh, dramatically in their impact. So for example, not only as an isolated complication do you see in the graph in the green area, the differences in mortality associated with isolated complications, but interestingly, if you look, for example, at ventilation, prolonged ventilation as an isolated complication was associated with a mortality of 8.8%. Isolated renal failure, as an, uh, again, as an isolated complication, carried a mortality or was associated with a mortality of 8.9%. However, when the two are combined, if you look in the middle yellow portion, you see that when ventilation and prolonged ventilation and renal failure were combined, mortality jumps to 46%, more than four times, either of them individually. So clearly, specific combinations of complications differed quite dramatically in their mortality impact. Fortunate thing, as we noted, is the, may, the way the model was developed, we were able to account for all possible combinations of complications in association with all possible operations in the model. Interestingly, the pattern of, complica of the complication mortality relationship was fairly constant across procedures. As you can see in this slide, even though the numbers vary somewhat, the basic pattern of complications 
uh, of, excuse me, a failure to rescue or mortality for complications was very similar across all, all of the operations examined. This further validated our decision to include all of the complication to a single model rather than developing separate models for each complication, excuse me, for each operation. Moreover, on the hospital level, mortality complication rates were more strongly associated with participant predicted risk of mortality than was observed failure to rescue. As you can see in this figure, on the left-hand side, if you, as you increase the participant's average predicted risk of mortality on the x-axis, looking at the observed percentage of complications on the y-axis, with each dot being a separate institution in the SDS database, you see a fairly smooth correlation between the patient's predicted risk of mortality and the occurrence of complications. However, when you use the same approach, participant average predicted risk of mortality on the x-axis and the observed failure to rescue rate on the y-axis, you now see a wide distribution where the correlation breaks down quite considerably. What it, this is telling you is that something other than patient-related factors are driving failure to rescue. And this further corroborates Silver's initial hypothesis 30 years ago when he introduced this metric. After arriving at the most comprehensive model with several, after several iterations, including the predicted risk of mortality, intraoperative factors, procedures, and all interactions of complications with the procedure, we arrived at a model with the highest discrimination. Had excellent calibration as observed versus expected failure to rescue. Had excellent calibration across the spectrum of predicted risk of mortality, and also excellent calibration across the spectrum of procedures, with each dot here being one of the seven procedures. And for complications, with each dot being a or each point and confidence interval represents one of 14 possible combinations of complications. The very wide confidence interval and an expected value of 0 0.36 represents only two patients with the combination of stroke, renal failure, and reoperation in the patient sample. There was a wide distribution in failure to rescue across sites enable us, excuse me, enabling us to use this metric in order to distinguish amongst sites. And similar to our star ratings, we can readily identify both positive and negative outliers. So most importantly, how would we use this information? Well, suppose a site has a high mortality and a high failure to rescue. Well, clearly there are problems here, but amongst other things, you know that one immediate fruitful opportunity for improvement is the post-operative care of the patients. Suppose you had a site with low mortality but high failure to rescue. How might you understand that? Well, this might be a site that generally operates on low-risk patients and does, in general, a very good job with them having a low mortality, but when unusual or uh, uncommon complications occur, there is a problem with being able to deal with them, and th therefore the opportunity for improvement is to be able to recognize and address the unusual, perhaps unusual, complications that do occur in their patients. Low mortality and low failure to rescue, so this would seem to be the perfect setting However, it's not necessarily ideal because it does not rule out a high complication rate, which although successfully managed may in and of itself represent a possible, an opportunity for improvement. Is it a perfect metric? 
Well, we don't include all complications. We include only those major ones for which the SDS has risk factors. We did not have sufficient information to include frailty, which is a known risk factor for failure to rescue, and is now in and of itself an active area of study within the Quality Measurement Task Force of the Society. And there is not time stamping of complications, so we were unable to identify a purported sentinel event that might lead to a cascade of subsequent complications. For the future, perhaps complication-specific metrics. These might be very useful to identify the specific areas uh, of strength or weakness in post-operative care in a given institution. What is the relation of failure to rescue with procedural volume? This is actually an area of controversy for which there is completely contradictory data and requires further study. What are the trends over time? Can failure to rescue be an effective means for tracking quality improvement efforts? And how, if at all, do we integrate this with other SDS quality metrics in assessing overall programmatic quality? We have much less, much yet to learn together. For now, we represent, we present a new SDS metric for failure to rescue, which meets the high standards for discrimination and calibration of prior SDS models. This metric adds incremental information related to institutional performance in the post-operative phase of care and it serves as a foundation for quality improvement as well as future research in patient care. On behalf of the Society, I would like to thank you for viewing and thank you for the opportunity and the privilege of presenting this work.